Hello everyone, this is Jotto, and welcome to a Top 10 Creatures video. This is the first of a couple Top 10s I'm doing. Uh, I'm also doing Top 10 Spells. I'm doing Top 10, uh, I mean not Top 10, Top 5 Artifacts, Top 5 Shrines, probably Top 5 uh, Blessings and Curses, so the permanent spells, things like that. Now, before we get started with the list, I can stream again. My internet is fixed. I actually did a late night stream yesterday, which was completely spontaneous, and my internet was fixed last night, so I thought, well, why not? Let's do a stream at midnight. So I did. Uh, but as of today, I'm going to be going back to my old schedule. So if you want to see that, that will be on the Twitch page, which is in the description as usual. So go check out that, and also my schedule should be in my uh, description as well. Now. For this particular list, we're looking at the top 10 creatures in the game. This was an interesting list to make because when you're looking at a list like this, you have to make a discrepancy between top 10 creatures in a vacuum and top 10 creatures in the current balance. And I chose current balance because I think it's more relevant because if you look at top 10 creatures in a vacuum, a whole bunch of creatures that see basically no play start popping up. Uh, whereas if you look at current balance, it gives you more of an insight into how the game actually works. Now, I do have a list of honorable mentions, because there's a lot of good creatures in this game, and a lot of them didn't quite make it, but are still worth mentioning. So, we'll start with the honorables. Uh, first things first, we have the Zombie Legionnaire. Uh, Zombie Legionnaire gets a note because it's the best one drop in the game. Uh, none of the actual one drops made it onto the list, because I think maybe, maybe Lizard would have made it, uh, because the old Lizard... The really old lizard, before it got changed at all, just the tutu. Uh, that probably would have made it, but that was because it was in red, and a tutu that can't really attack or block anything is more relevant in red, whereas Zombie Legionnaires is strictly better than the old lizard. However, Corruption's weaker, so it gets tapered out a little bit, but it is still worth mentioning because it's a very powerful one drop. Uh, next, we've got Bloodwell Matriarch, also in the honorable mentions. Now, this came very close to making the list, and I cut it later on. The reason for it is because it's very powerful, but it's situational. It's often not very good, and also the fact it's double uh, Dominion means that it's pretty much only played in Wisdom Dominion Control. You can play it in other decks, but that's pretty much the only deck it sees play in realistically, is Wisdom Dominion Control. So it has a limited amount of play, and also it's not very good against certain colors. Like, it does have some issues even even against red now, because Fireball got nerfed, which is weirdly enough a nerf to Matriarch. Uh, so yeah, Matriarch dropped down a little bit from where it used to be. Uh, on to another card with the same requirements, Namir. Now, Namir is one of those cards where in a vacuum he's ludicrously powerful, but he sees very little play, pretty much only Clone plays him. He's very powerful, but the problem is that he requires a lot of setup, you need three levels, and also, his effect is strong on its own, but to make it really strong, you need things like Cavalry Field Captain and Angel Blessed Knight on the board. So it just, it's too many hoops to jump through. Although if you are going for a double order deck, then it is very powerful. It does work with Instill Life, etc., but it's just not quite there. Although I do think it's worth looking into whenever you're making an order deck. Uh, moving on, we have Gibbo and Ronnie, if I can find this thing. There you go. Giron Ronnie would have probably made top 10 last month, or the month before, when red was really dominant. But in the current metagame, it dies to Militia, which is really awkward, and it's not particularly good against green, because the only thing it can attack is Sharpshooter, and Sharpshooter picks off one of the goblins, and you can't attack Sharpshooter even with both of them, because they both die, and you can't attack anything else. So, Gibbon Ronnie just isn't very good in the current metagame. Every deck has a way of either 2 for one or 1 for one Gibbon Ronnie, which is very impressive, keep in mind. So, it does drop down a little bit from where it used to be. Although, I do think that in certain metagames, Gibbon Ronnie is definitely top 10 worthy. Uh, next, we've got two cards that, depending on who you ask, could actually end up on the top 10. We've got Guardian of the Faithful. Uh, Guardian is arguably the most powerful card at this uh, cost, with one exception, which we'll get to a little bit later, being the 3 level 3 mana. However, it's a bit weak in the current metagame. Uh, Dominion is rampant, and Bloodseeker Mutant helps Dominion kill it in multiple ways with Assassinate. 
On top of that, you've got a drop in red, which is where it really shined, an increase in aggro decks that rely on tokens, like uh, even Brothers are seeing a lot of play in Neva decks, and that is essentially only a 2 for 1 with the Guardian, which sounds good, but you're investing a lot to get this Guardian out, and you really rely on it. Whereas now, it only destroys 3 creatures, so, yeah, that sounds good and all, but in practice it often isn't. On top of that, there's actually a lot of ways of getting stuff to 4-4 now with some of the might counters, which kind of just goes over the 3-4. Uh, the now, if it was a 4-4, it would be astonishing, but 3-4 is uh, a little bit easier to get past than it used to be, so Guardian drops down a little bit. Now, the last card in the Honorable Mentions is actually... Flesh Sculptor. Now, Flesh Sculptor lost out to the uh, other Corruption 3 drop in this case, which is actually number 10, we'll get to in a bit. And the reason for it is because it's very powerful, but it's situationally a 2 for 1. So sometimes it's a 2 for 1, you trade and you get a Legionnaire, that's awesome. But the Legionnaires don't always actually do anything later on in the game, you need tons of them. And you realistically need multiple Flesh Sculptors to make them really, really insane. And the fact that Advanced Never Got Nerfed did hurt Flesh Sculptor's playability a little bit. It is still ludicrously powerful, but it didn't quite make top 10. So, on to the top 10 itself. We've got, at number 10, Mesmerizing Spirit. Now, Mesmerizing Spirit is one of those cards where it's always a 2 for 1. It's pretty much always a 2 for 1. It's very hard to 1 for 1 a Mesmerizing Spirit, and it is completely impossible to uh, two for one of Mesmerizing Spirit because it makes you discard. Well, it's not completely impossible, but I guess if you play it when your opponent has no cards in hand, but that's about it. Like, that that's about as bad as it's getting, and if your opponent has no cards in hand, that's not a problem. So yeah, the Mesmerizing Spirit is so powerful because it does something immediately. The body's relevant for the cost. Uh, two attack with two speed is actually very relevant. It trades with a lot of stuff. And the real strength of this card is the flying. Flying allows it to be an offensive and defensive tool whenever it needs to be without having a one-turn transition. And on top of that, it allows you to pick when you want to block. That is really important. Not even swift creatures can do that from the back row. It, it allows you to decide when to block, and it makes it very difficult to get rid of if you're playing a color that relies on combat for removal, like nature, for instance. So Mesmerizing Spirit, very, very strong corruption card, and one of one of the better uh, two-mana, two-requirement cards in the game. Moving on to another two-mana, two-requirement card, Unicorn. Now, Unicorn made it here over Gnome, which... Gnome is good, but Unicorn is busted compared to Gnome. Like, the difference is astonishing. <laughs> you get plus one HP... And you get plus one speed. <laughs> That's an insane buff over Gnome. Now, Gnome does work with energy, but that doesn't really come up very often. The plus one health is more uh, important than you'd think, but what really makes this insane is that it's spell or artifact removal that still builds your board very substantially. Like, two mana later on in the game... I mean, you can't play it on curve as an elf warrior, but it's basically a slightly weaker elf warrior because it's not an elf. And that's enough to have on an artifact removal. On top of that, it's two mana, so if you're playing Advanced Neva, it works with that. And the fact that it's one requirement means you can splash it if you're splashing things like Haldiri Rider. Although Wisdom does end up getting uh, splashed more than Nature. The fact That's probably why Unicorn does end up lower on this list. It's just the fact that it's very, very powerful, but it only works with green, really, because green isn't splashed that much. And also it's not that useful against certain decks. So, Unicorn does make it onto a top 10 list, but doesn't get that high up on it. So, that's number 9. On to the number 8. Another 2-mana, two 2-requirement two card, Force Mage Protector. Now, Force Mage Protector is the one of the best aggro stops in the entire game. It's very, very strong. The shield is at the moment at its weakest it's ever been, pretty much, because red has died off largely. And it's still good! <laughs> like, Force Mage Protector allows you to do some very disgusting things with things like uh, Assassin, 
out of Dominion, where you get a Deadly with a shield on it, which is brutal. It also allows you to block uh, ranged creatures, like uh, like uh, Sharpshooter, without losing your creature and actually killing the Sharpshooter because it absorbs the damage. And on top of that, it allows you to just do some silly things with Lamp. That Dealing with a Lamp with a shield on it, it if you don't have Artifact removal, is basically impossible. And that is, I mean, you have to have Pacify, basically. That's pretty much all that works against a Shielded Lamp if you don't have Direct Artifact Removal. And just the fact that a 3-drop has such a high level of relevance later on in the game is what makes it super powerful. If you notice that all three of the 3-drops that we talked about on the top 10 list so far have a very high late-game relevance. Protector Shield never loses its relevance in the late-game. Mesmerizing Spirit's very good when you're both in top deck mode, because if they have a trick that they're holding, you just get rid of it. And Unicorn is always useful. That's a real, Im that's a really important thing about the, uh, the two mana, two aspect creatures, is if they have to be good in the late game as well, it gives them a lot more play and a lot more decks. Alright, on to a non-three drop creature, Karthus at number seven. A lot of people would think that Karthus would end up at number one or two. I put him way further down. Uh, Karthus is very, very powerful. Keep in mind that I put him at number seven, but the cards above him are ludicrously strong. So that would be why he ends up down here. Now, the reason I put Karthus down here is because he realistically only sees playing about two or three decks, which is Order Dominion, mid range, or control decks, and. Wisdom Dominion Control. That's pretty much it. He's an exclusively control card, and that does diminish his playability a lot. On top of that, he does have some issues against aggro decks where he's he's not a stabilizing card. He's a card that allows you to get an advantage after a Cataclysm, and that has weakened him a lot, where if you don't have that Cataclysm, you're basically screwed, because the aggro decks for like Soldiers and Turbo Elves are so fast that Karthus is largely useless against them unless you have a lot of early game defense, which is why it's good in order, because they have a lot of early game defense against those decks. But he's, at the moment, he's at his weakest point I think he's ever been. He's very strong against mid-range and control decks, but against aggro decks, he's not as powerful as he used to be since he got nerfed a few times, and he does rely on your opponent not being able to kill you by turn 7, which is something that you can't always rely on. On top of that, uh, Cataclysm requires you to go up to 5 mana, 2 levels, or 3 levels really, uh, if you're playing Wisdom Dominion. So you have to go 5 mana, 3 levels, and then go Karthus. So that does work, but it delays everything by a turn. So Karthus does fall down a little bit. He is still ludicrously powerful because of that effect, though. That effect of destroying a creature immediately, unconditional removal, is one of the strongest abilities in the entire game. The only reason he falls down a bit is his massive cost. Uh, hindering him. The body, by the way, on this, the 4-4 body is incredibly relevant. I mentioned earlier that Guardian of the Faithful was a bit weaker now because 4-4s four are a bit more common. However, that's from might counters, but 5-5 five, five is very hard to get to. So a Karthus will actually trade with a 4-4 four, four, and then you get a guaranteed 2-for-1 pretty much, or a 3-for-1 if they had to use a might counter to get it to that level. And just that ability is very strong in the late game. That's why he is the He's the uh, the seven drop of choice that makes it onto this particular list. All right, on to Haldiri Rider. Haldiri Rider is one of those cards that is so good at snowballing that it actually will just win games on its own. It does. Haldiri Rider does three things. It ends the game after board wipe since it does three from hand or four, or even five with Amber Strike or four with the Elf Land. For 4 mana and 2 requirement, on turn 4, you can just keep hitting them. It also answers pretty much anything you can play ahead of it, which is just amazing. The 3-3 three, three with 3 speed is very hard to block, and the fact that it has swift means it can kill a lot of stuff. And on top of that, if you're winning and you play a Haldiri Rider, they are dead. They can't recover from a Haldiri Rider plus another board. It just can't be done. You need to use hard removal on a Haldiri Rider pretty much since Fireball is less relevant now. The only cheap removal that deals with it is pretty much Pacify. And that's not something... You can't really hold up two mana for the entire game uh, waiting for this Haldiri Rider to happen because you just lose. So Haldiri Rider is very difficult to deal with right now and is a very powerful snowball card. 
All right, on to the top five. These are the incredibly powerful creatures, and I don't think any of these are going to be a surprise. On to number five, Phoenix. Yes, Phoenix was as low as number five. As I said, uh, power in metagame is different from power in a vacuum, and Phoenix is one of the most powerful creatures in a vacuum. It's probably one or two in a vacuum. And maybe a month and a half ago, before the advanced Neva deck started adjusting to Phoenix by playing tons of Fae of Charms and Word of Vigors, Phoenix would have probably been number one, or number two, in terms of creatures. However, since advanced Zash got nerfed, since a lot of their aggro got nerfed, Honestly, Phoenix has dropped down a bit because the red decks that are supporting it have disappeared. And it's double red, so you can't really splash it. And as a result, kind of like Guardian of the Faithful, it doesn't really have a home right now, and so it's dropped down a lot. However, do not underestimate the power of this thing. 3-3 three, three with 3 speed and flying. I talked about flying being very important to Mesmerizing Spirit. Phoenix just goes above and beyond what Mesmerizing Spirit can do. It costs a lot more being plus one aspect and also plus one mana, but it kills everything. And because you're playing red, unlike with Guardian of the Faithful where it's weak to four fours, Phoenix can just not block and then attack and word of fire. Because you're playing red, you can make up that difference a lot more easily than Order can. And on top of that, it's not like if you word of fire and trade half a Phoenix, you basically go up on card advantage by half a card and you still have a three three on the board. It's basically impossible to beat for several aspects. Uh, nature has to bounce it, otherwise they can't get past it at all, pretty much. They need, well, Fae of Charm nerfed significantly, they basically need Tree. Uh, if they don't have Ancient Tree Ant, they just can't get past Phoenix at all. Corruption is just dead if you play a Phoenix. Uh, Order can kind of deal with it over multiple turns, but it's still really rough. The only aspect that can really deal with it very easily is Dominion. They can either shrink it or they can helm it, and then it's just brutal. But besides that, Phoenix is very good against pretty much everything. It's just the decks it's in that have dropped down a little bit, which is why it's sort of fallen from its number one or two spot all the way down to five. On to number four. Now, this is something which I think a lot of people were expecting to be a little bit higher which is the Assassin. Now, this is something that I had at 3 originally, but I did change my mind a little bit. But Assassin is the best 2-drop in the game right now. It's so strong. It basically trades with anything, uh, unless it has multiple lives like Phoenix, but it trades with pretty much anything, and I mentioned earlier the shenanigans with Force Mage Protector causing some serious headaches uh, for people. The reason this is not as high as 2 or 3, which is where most people would place it, is that Dominion is very popular right now, and it's very weak to Dominion. Ironically, it's weak to its own color, and the reason for it is because weakness count one weakness counter makes Shadow Step Assassin completely useless. It does absolutely nothing at that point. And with Bloodseeking Mutant seeing so much play, and also with Cathedral being around, it's really rough for Shadow Step Assassin, and it means that it's very difficult to actually play it again in the Dominion mirror matches, and it drops down a lot. Now, it is still a ludicrously powerful 2-drop, as it trades with anything in Elves, which is very relevant, and means that Dominion has a very good matchup against Elves, because you have Assassin, Assassinate, and Cathedral, which are all amazing in their matchup. And on top of that, the fact that it can trade with anything is very relevant. It means that you can play an Assassin and Stonewall or Karthus, which I always found quite funny. And if you have Protector, you can play Assassin on 2. And just, if you're playing, this is a trick with Coronas, actually, you play Assassin on 2 then they can either play a creature to trade or just not play a creature or play some really bad creature like um, if you're playing it's red they'll just play like a Fia or something and just leave it on back row which I mean Fia is a good card but not against Shadow Step Assassin so they'll probably play Fia, leave it on back row and just wait uh, and just use their mana basically and then you can just attack with Assassin and play out your uh, your Corona's Hero Power and then you get a 2-2 and there's nothing they can do about it, and they have to be worried, because if you haven't shown your second color, you could be playing Wisdom. And then if they play a good creature, you just play a Protector, shield the Assassin and kill it, and there's nothing they can do about it. And that's why Assassin is so powerful. It is very weak to Dominion, but against a lot of other, a lot of other colors, pretty much all of them apart from... Uh, I mean, Noxious Fumes does tempo it out a little bit, but Noxious Fumes kills almost every 2-drop, that's why that's a very good card. 
But apart, unless you're against Dominion, Assassin is absolutely amazing. That's why it earns the number four spot. Now, on to a recent newcomer to the metagame, Cavalry Field Captain at number three. Cavalry Field Captain has been one of those cards that has just come out of nowhere in the last month. It did see some play uh, before then in... Uh, we had Hermeleon Green playing Cavalry Field Captain because you could uh, use and still life with it. And Cavalry Field Captain in general was always played in Soldiers and things like that. But in the last couple of weeks, it has been absolutely dominant. Cavalry Field Captain is one of those cards where if you're playing on curve and you play this on three, you can't win if you have a Cavalry Field Captain curve. They basically just change their Dwarf Musketeers into three twos with range with three speed. Meaning you can kill pretty much anything at that point in the game. Militia are now 3-speed 2-2s two when you buff them, which is incredibly relevant because they kill elves. And on top of that, you can just use it at any point in the game, and it's powerful. And if that wasn't enough, it works with instill life in a ludicrous fashion, where you can get two cavalry field captains and double buff something up to 4-speed, or spread out buffs and just win a combat immediately. And it has an extra ability on top of having the unicorn body being a 2-2 two -two with 3-speed, it's also a knight if you're playing the mirror. The retreat ability is one of the most underestimated abilities in the entire game. It allows you to do some very irritating things, like it means that no one can ever attack into a cavalry field captain if they're behind, they want to trade with it, because you can't really risk waiting to block it because they could have other cavalry field captains or they could have any of the order soldier buffs or things like that and then you're just completely screwed. Or at worst case scenario, they could even have a Namir, uh, which would be really brutal. So, you have to try and attack this thing, but then you just retreat it. So they basically waste an attack. I mean, sure, the cavalry field captain can't attack anymore, but you're just permanently blocking something, and there's nothing they can do about it. So they have to attack the face and hope you block it, which no one ever does. On top of that, you can do some weird stuff with the retreat stuff, like you can play around a trick by attacking with the cavalry field captain first, because attackers have the last say in combat. So if they have a 2-2... Uh, let's say they have an elf, an elf warrior, and you're worried about an amber strike, or a tornado outbreak. So you attack it with your. Um, let's just say you attack it with a cavalry field captain, and you're worried about another trick. So you attack it with a second one. I was thinking about three speed stuff, but it gets a bit complicated. Basically, the point is you double attack it. And then, if they do play a trick, you just let the cavalry field captain die, and then use instill life with it later, and you save your more important creature. And if they don't have a trick, you retreat the cavalry field captain, and then the 3-3, three, three, or the, uh, in this case, if it's a 3-3, three, three, it'll just eat it. Or you can have just situations where you can attack with 3-2 uh, dwarf musketeers, and it's only weak to a trick. And if they don't use the trick, they get completely screwed. You can do this against protectors a lot, by the way. Is If they shield it, you leave the captain there. If they shield something else, you retreat it and get the free combat. And stuff like that is really difficult to play against and means that the, uh, the captain does take control away from your opponent. And that's one of the really, really powerful things about the card. On to number two, we have the Bloodseeking Mutant. The all-star of this format currently. Bloodseeking Mutant, with the nerf of Fireball and the absence of Red, has become a one-man army in some situations. It absolutely crushes aggro decks now, since it kills something immediately and every turn thereafter. And also, they don't hurt each other at all. Like, before, you just have to bounce them to your hand if you ran out of creatures to feed to them. But now, they just sit there, they're both 4-4s four or something, and 4-4 four four or 5-5. Five five. Bloodseeking Mutants are pretty much impossible to deal with when you play a creature and it gets minus 2, minus 2 immediately from two different mutants. Meaning that multiples are actually good now, and on top of that, it deals with pretty much anything. I mentioned Assassin earlier at number 4, and one of the reasons it dropped down a place or two is because of Mutant. And I think I stand by that. Mutant has been such a powerful card recently. It's also why Phoenix is a bit weaker than it used to be, because now Dominion can either go Helm on turn 4 in response to a Phoenix, uh, if you uh, sparked it out, or on turn 5 they can do it as well, or they can just go Bloodseeking Mutant on turn 4, play a Phoenix, 
Another mutant on turn 5, and now the Phoenix is a 1-1. One, one, and it hasn't actually resurrected yet, meaning it's just really weak. And that's one of the reasons why Mutant has affected the game so much. It's just that a lot of the old powerful cards were kind of neutered by, uh, by Mutant just making them smaller, since a lot of them were relying on their stats, as opposed to just raw abilities. Whereas things like Karthus are not re Karthus is not affected by Mutant at all, in fact. And you have things like Cavalry Field Captain, which have ha uh, which can buff things out of range, where you'll have people leaving mutants on front row and thinking that they have to invest quite heavily. Whereas if you're playing Order, you can just go Cavalry Field Captain plus another buff. And that's one of the reasons why the Captain has come up a little bit. And Bloodseeking Mutant has affected the game massively. It's also why Elf decks have to play Landslide now. They have to play Landslide. There's no choice. And Things like Word of Vigor are very crucial for those decks because otherwise you'll just lose your entire army to the uh, to the mutant or two on the board, and it's absolutely brutal. Now, the only reason this doesn't make number one is because it, while it is very splashable, and Dominion in general is very splashable with Bloodseeking Mutant now, it doesn't quite reach the same level of play in absolutely anything as the number one creature does. And some of you may have been able to guess this by now. Library Guards! Library Guards has been probably the best creature in the game for a very long time, apart from when Karthus was absolutely overpowered. Uh, but the reason Library Guards makes number one is because it doesn't look impressive, it's just like, oh, you draw a card, that's really good. And it has 2-3 three with 3 speed, sure, but it dies to Haldir Rider, eh, it's not very good. Until you realize that Wisdom is a very splashable color. You can play Protector and Library Guards and you're pretty much set as far as Wisdom goes. That's all you need to splash in some decks. And Library Guards and Protector are both very powerful cards, but Library Guards really does put it over the top, because it has some ludicrous late game uh, inclinations whenever you play this. So you're both in top deck wars, and then you top deck Library Guards, and you play the Library Guards, and then play another creature that you top deck from the Library Guards, and then you win the game. Because that, that ability to chain cards off the top of your deck is something that other creatures simply don't have. Whereas Library Guards does. It also stabilizes your hand a lot. It's good against aggro, especially now that red is less uh, important. Where before the card advantage didn't matter as much. When they would just fireball your Library Guards and then just keep attacking you. And you wouldn't play all the cards in your hand anyway, so it didn't matter. However, with red being out of the way, Library Guards is a massive aggro stop. Pretty much the only thing that trumps it when you play it is Cavalry Field Captain. But then they had to invest the entire attack into it, and you're probably just stalling for time. Because if you're playing blue-red, you have a Fire Blast now, which is going to be super effective against their board. Now they have a 2-2 and probably a couple 1 HP creatures. Or, if you're playing Dominion, you've just stalled an extra turn for a Cataclysm, which is very, very important. And that blue splash is what makes Wisdom Dominion viable as a... Uh, as a control deck most of the time. You get that New Horizons and you get Library Guards Protector. That combination is what stabilizes you as Wisdom Dominion and that's why it's necessary. And Library Guards is probably the most important card in that section. Like you can do without New Horizons although it is very powerful. You can substitute Protector early game for things like Assassin and Assassinate and kinda survive. But the difference between getting Library Guards on turn 4 and getting, say, a Cathedral Activation on turn 4 is huge. Cathedral Activation is still good, but Library Guards is just way, way stronger. And if that wasn't enough, the 2-3 body, while it is weak to things like Caldera Rider and Phoenix, well, less so Phoenix because you're playing Dominion a lot with Library Guards, so you can actually just shrink it or just steal it. Against Haldir Rider, it sounds brutal until you realize what actually happens. Where you play Library Guards, and then they play Haldir Rider and attack you. And then you either Helm it, or you Fireball it, or Fire Blast is even stronger. So what happened there, really? So you play Library Guards, they play Haldir, they get in 4 damage from their other elves or something, uh, and they kill your Library Guards. That sounds really bad. And then you Fire Blast, because they set up the perfect board state, because they had to put their Haldir Rider on the board at that time, and then you just wipe their board. And it's weird how a weakness of a card sets up things like that. The only card this is really weak to is probably Mutant. And the reason for that is because Mutant makes it a 1-2, which is not very relevant. And if you're playing Dominion, you also have access to Mind Extort, which prevents your opponent from having a lot of those cards that 
uh, library guards help set up situations for, like Fire Blast, Helm, things like that. And that can really hurt. As I said, it's also a bit weak to Cavalry Field Captain, but it lets you set up a stalling situation where you can use the rest of your deck to make up for the, uh, the tempo loss. So anyway, that is my top 10 creatures in Spellweaver. Now, for the next list I'll do, I'll probably do a video on top 10 spells next. I don't know when I'm going to do that, though. Um, since I do have streaming to do now, <laughs> as opposed to video making. But, yeah, now besides that, I am thinking of uploading a video talking about how to prepare a sideboard for Asperia. Because the Asperia Cup is on Sunday, so if anyone's interested in seeing a video on how to construct a sideboard for Asperia and what kind of things you should be trying to do for an archetype, then put something in the comments and then I'll do that tomorrow. But anyway, thank you all for watching. If you like the content, please subscribe. If you have any feedback, put it in the comment section below. If you want to check out my Twitch stream, the schedule is in the description, and I can actually stream now that my internet is fixed. And if you have any queries about sort of why I put things on the list and the ordering of that, then if you put something in the comments, I'll see if I can get around to it. Bas now, Spinjotto, signing off.